So, we finished the preliminary filtration, now let's start with tubular reabsorption. So molecule and ion, they can uh, reabsorb uh, either actively or passively. When we talk about reabsorption, we, we mean that the molecule and ion, they go from nephron into blood vessels. So the direction is important. It go from nephron into the blood vessels, uh, specifically the peritubular capillaries. So sodium is uh, reabsorbed mainly by active transport. So only 65% of the sodium is reabsorbed by the active transport. And as I repeatedly mentioned, the absorption of sodium is important because it um, direct it it uh, direct the re, uh, it regulate the reabsorption of water. And then chloride also follows. When sodium is reabsorbed, then chloride follows. And it already, I already told you this point. Um, it, uh, when we reabsorb sodium back to the blood, it increases the osmolarity of the blood, and then it also and then water will be reabsorbed to, into the blood because of osmosis. So nutrients, uh, glucose and amino acids, they also enter into blood, but all these are being done, the reabsorption is done by carrier proteins. So carrier proteins are the ones that transport the glucose from the nephron back into the blood. Glucose should be completely reabsorbed, um, but when we have too much glucose uh, in the blood and during the glomerular filtration, we all the glucose, they are being, all the excess glucose are being filtered into the nephron. Then the reabsorption of the glucose back into the blood vessels may not be complete. The reason is that when you have too much glucose in the filtrate, in the nephron, when, then the, all the carrier protein reach their maximum workload work capacity. When all the carrier protein they reach their maximum work capacity, then what will happen? Some of the glucose will not be able to uh, be reabsorbed back to the capillary in the blood. Then you will have some glucose in your filtrate in the nephron. Then what will happen? Your your urine will have glucose in it, and we call this diabetes. Diabetes is mainly because your liver or your glycogen cannot store glucose as uh, your liver or your muscle cannot store glucose as glycogen. Why is that? Uh, one of the reasons is that the beta cells in your pancreas cannot produce insulin. And when in your body does not have insulin, then uh, your liver and your muscle cannot convert glucose into glycogen. Then you have all the glycogen uh, flo freely flowing in your blood. And when, then you have high blood uh, glucose level, we call it hyperglycemia. High blood glucose level, uh, that causes, uh, as I told you in the last slides, uh, the, after the glomerular filtration, when all the glucose, they, are, they go into the nephron as the filtrate, and then the uh, tubular reabsorption, because all the carrier protein, they reach the maximum capacity to, uh, to try to reabsorb all the glucose back to the blood, then some of the glucose will left remain in, your, in the filtrate, and then they will become your urine. Then for the kidney cannot reabsorb all the glucose in the filtrate. And then in this case, your filtrate, that means your future urine, will have a high glucose level. Because it has high glucose level, so making the filtrate very concentrated, then what will happen? Osmosis will occur so that the water will go from the blood vessels into your nephron. Because you have high concentrated uh, filtrate. And this, what will happen is that the diabetic patient will, will go, will have frequent urination because you will have more 
urine production. Because, well, I told you that water will go from blood vessel into the nephron because you have high concentration of uh, glucose there. And the person will, will, uh, will feel thirsty all the time because they keep on losing water from the blood vessels into the nephron. So, um, the filter then enters the uh, proximal confluent tubule. There's two portions. Some of them, the part that can reabsorb uh, into the blood vessels, mostly water, nutrient, like, like glucose and amino acid, and then salt, different type of salt. For those that, so for those uh, components that cannot be reabsorbed, some of the water, most of the nitrogenous waste, like urea and uric acid, and then uh, some of the excess salt. The last part of the uh, urine formation is through the tubular secretion. Tubular secretion is the second way to remove certain from the blood to the tubular fluid, that means your future urine. What, what is the first way to remove the substances from the blood into the tubular fluid? What is the first way to remove substances from the blood and to tubular fluid? So the first way is the glomerular filtration. So glomerular filtration is the first way to, to do that. Tubular secretion is the second way. So um, you have hydrogen ion that make your blood acidic, potassium ion. Um, we want to, uh, even in the nervous system, I'll talk about why we want to get rid of potassium ion. Um, the main reason is that we want to keep the blood and also the extracellular fluid high with sodium ion but low with potassium ion. Creatinine and many drugs. Drug is the major thing. Drug is the major thing that we want to get rid of in this, uh, in, the, in, in, in this part. Drugs so is not limited to medication that you take, but also the drug that we, we all like to take in holidays, namely the alcohol, beer, wine. Alcohol is the kind of drug that we want to get rid of. And then uh, uh, urine. Oh, but the drug. Oh, we don't. We do not pee out alcohol per se, because your liver. Uh, after we drink alcohol, our liver will break down alcohol into a uh, uh, different the aldehyde or something like that. Uh, so that uh, we, when we we can pee out uh, not alcohol directly, but uh, it is. Uh, May it should be aldehyde that we pee out because of the we break down alcohol into aldehyde into a less toxic aldehyde. And then urine ends up uh, has two things: filter substance that have not been absorbed, and substance that have been actively secreted. Filter substance that have not been uh, reabsorbed, uh, like the water or, or some kind of salt that we don't want. Substance that we want to actively secreted, namely drugs. So, um, so that's it for the tubular, tubular secretion, we just simplify it. So we want to talk about uh, main, how our kidney also take part in the role to maintain the uh, water, the volume of the blood and also the blood pressure here. As I told you that uh, water and salt, they go together. So, um, uh, is it being reabsorbed through the uh, proximal complementary tubule? Osmo regulation. By regulating, how do we regulate the amount of uh, water in our body? So, hypertonic. Hypertonic. Remember this term, hypertonic. So it is uh, meaning that it is highly concentrated urine. So if we, we absorb most of the water, 
then we, we can treat the hypotonic uh, urine. But the reabsorption motor requires these three things. The reabsorption of the salt, I, I repeatedly emphasize this point already. And then, our other, in addition to the reabsorption of salt, we have to establish a gradient, solid, sol, solute gradient, the concentration gradient of the solute. And also, we have certain water by aquaporin. Aquaporin is basically a channel that, um, a channel specifically for water to travel because uh, our cell membrane is, all cell membrane, they are phospholipid bilayer. The lipid part will block the uh, entrance or exit of the water because the water molecule, they are polar. So we need aquaporin. But you may say, what about osmosis? How does osmosis occur? Osmosis occur is mainly because the cell membrane has aquaporin. That's how water can go in and out of the cell membrane because of the aquaporin channel. Reabsorption of the salt. So um, uh, it, we emphasize that we can regulate the blood by um, uh, regulating the salt. So sodium um, is a key ion, but we also regulate all other ions. Most of the sodium, they are being filtered in, in the glomerulus by the glomerular filtration. And then most of sodium return to the blood. Most of them at the proximal convoluted tubule. Some of them, about one fourth, one quarter of them, through the reabsorption by the um, blue of honey, blue of honey, and then uh, only a little bit, seven percent less than ten percent, uh, reabsorbed by the distal convoluted tubule. So aldosterol, remember we talked about aldosterol uh, in the first video? So kidney secrete renin and then renin uh, induce the secretion of the aldosterol. Aldosterol promotes the excretion of potassium ion but reabsorption of the sodium ion. So when, 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 when we have a low blood volume or low, low blood pressure, then um, kidney will release aldosterol. And remember renin? Renin is the enzyme, not hormone, secreted by uh, kidney as well. In the kidney, there's something called, there's a structure called juxtaglomerular apparatus. Juxta means uh, next to glomerular. That is glomerulus. That means this structure, this apparatus, is right next to the glomerulus. Juxta glomerular apparatus uh, secrete renin. When they when it detects your blood pressure is low, then it will secrete renin, and then renin will uh, will convert something called uh, will convert the uh, will, will, will will lead will lead to the aldosterone release. We will talk about this. A reaction later, the reaction cascade. So this is what I talk about the uh, we call it RAA pathway. Renin, uh, renin, angiotensin, and, and aldosterone pathway. So this is the pathway. So the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So when the blood pressure is low, then the juxtaglomerular juxtaglomerular apparatus will secrete renin. Then renin will, is an enzyme that speeds up chemical reaction. The chemical reaction is the angiotensinogen uh, converted into angiotensin 1. Angio means blood vessel, tensin means the tension. Uh, sin usually is a protein. So it is a protein that will Increase the tension of the blood vessels requiring angiotensin 1. How does it increase the tension of the blood vessels? By vasoconstriction. When the blood vessels constrict, that means that decrease the diameter of the blood vessels, then it will increase the tension on the blood vessels. 
And then angiotensin 1 will be converted to angiotensin 2. Then angiotensin 2 will stimulate the adrenal cortex. Again, adrenal cortex is the outer layer of the adrenal gland. Adrenal gland is a gland that's sitting on top of the kidney. And adrenal cortex will secrete aldosterone. Aldosterone will promote the excretion of potassium ion and reabsorption of sodium ion. And then as I repeatedly emphasize this point, reabsorption of the sodium ion into the blood will follow the reabsorption will be followed by the reabsorption of the water into the blood. In this case, when we have more water going into the blood, then the blood volume will increase. And then when the blood volume increases, the blood pressure will also increase. In this case, we can restore the blood pressure. What do we call this? What do we call this? We learn about this in the uh, human organization online lecture. What do we call this? It is an example we call negative feedback. And negative feedback is one of the uh, mechanisms for homeostasis. Homeostasis, the reason of going through this uh, RAA pathway, renin, angiotensin and aldosterone pathway is to restore our blood pressure. How do we restore our blood pressure? By restoring our blood volume. How do we restore our blood volume? By reabsorbing water. By reabsorbing water, we can restore the blood volume. How do we reabsorb? How do we increase the reabsorption of water? By reabsorption of sodium, the, the salt. So that's the whole idea here. Uh, it's all about homeostasis. So you can see it in here. Oh, okay. In this picture, we can see the photos right here. Photos are their cell. That again, photos are their cell that are uh, 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 wrapping around the capillary of the glomerulus so that it uh, forms small pores and restrict the molecule that can go out from the blood vessels into glomerulus. And you can see that the juxtaglomerular apparatus are located here on the distal convoluted tube. The distal convoluted tube is uh, physically uh, in contact with the afferent and the efferent arterial. In here, in this picture, you can see that the afferent arterial is a lot thicker than the efferent arterial, so that it can create a positive pressure in the glomerulus. And the juxtaglomerular apparatus is located uh, on the distal convoluted tubule, and it is only located right next to the afferent arterial here. It is not. It is not located next to efferent. The reason is that this juxtaglomerular apparatus can sense the uh, changes, physical changes of this afferent arterial. What does it mean? When you have high, when you have um, uh, low blood pressure, just like what we talk about here, when the blood pressure in the glomerulus is low, when why would it happen? When, when the blood pressure is low, meaning that uh, the blood volume is decreased. When blood volume decreases, then the afferent arterial will also decrease in the diameter. The physical changes of the diameter of the afferent arterial can be sensed by the physical movement here, because they are in contact. So if it decreases the diameter, then the juxtaglomerular apparatus can also sense the movement here, sense the uh, changes here. Then you, it you will know that okay, the volume is decreased, so that the pressure is decreased. Then then you will start to secrete renin, and then then you you can have the uh, RAA pathway uh, to trick to be triggered to restore the uh, uh, blood pressure. Now, let's, other than RAA pathway, we have this atrial natriuretic uh, hormone, ANH, atrial natriuretic uh, uh, hormone. As the name suggested, atrial, meaning that it, it is secreted by the atria of the heart. 
So um, it is uh, enters the uh, top chamber, the upper chamber of your heart. Um, when when you when when you have increased this, the atrial the natural urethral hormone is when you have high blood pressure. When your blood volume increases, that means you have a high blood pressure. So it is secreted by right atrium, specifically right atrium of the heart. When you are when you have, when you have a increase in blood volume, so that your heart tissue stretch, your right atrium stretch. When your right atrium stretch, it tells tells your body that you have more blood volume. That means your high blood pressure. Then you will inhibit the renin secretion, and also it will uh, inhibit the aldosterone release. So the RA pathway will shut down, and then. Um, and then this, because the RA pathway shut down, then it will increase the sodium excretion. Sodium excretion, uh, we call it a natriuresis. natriuresis. So ANH, atrial natri, natriuretic hormone, shut down the uh, RA pathway to promote uh, sodium excretion. Of when we have more sodium excreted in the urine, that means we have more water follows to excrete in the urine as well. So we have a, a long loop of nephron, two part descending ascending limb in the loop of honey. Remember the loop of honey? So sodium or the salt diffuses out from the lower part of the ascending limb. And then uh, so it's by natural diffusion, but uh, it is actively transferred to the upper part of the ascending limb. Uh, it is actively transferred in the uh, active part of the ascending limb. And then the ascending limb is impermeable to water. When the ascending limb is impermeable to water, what will happen? So as the as the as the as we have less and less salt available for transport as fluid moves up to the ascending limb, uh, uh, then the osmotic gradient in then we have a differences in the concentration um, in the renal medulla. And as I said, the urea also contributes to the solute concentration in the medulla, and then. Um, because um, a urea, they are leaked from the lower collecting duct. And this result in the increasing in the concentration gradient, favoring the reabsorption of the water. This part is basically creating the uh, concentration gradient of the solute, so that it will increase the reabsorption of water. But this picture shows you what happened. So descending limb, okay, you have um, uh, because of the pressure difference here, uh, a lot of uh, water will be uh, being uh, filtered out or squeezed out in the loop of any. In ascending limb, so sodium will, will go out uh, at the beginning and then later on it has to go through the active transport. So you have more and more sodium here in this part. And the water follows, as you know, that water follows the sodium salt, and also you will also go in here. And in this case, when you have more water going into this part, then remember vasorector reactor in here. Vasorector reactor in here will reabsorb all the water and, and salt as well, and here. So basically, this this is what we call tunnel current. A counter current. This is what we call a counter current because there's an increasing solute concentration when we go down in the material. Then all this water, sodium, chloride, and urea, they can be reabsorbed back to the vasa reactor, the vessels. And basically, this counter current here um, enhances the reabsorption of retention of the fluid.
So water leaves the descending limb of the loop of family because of osmotic gradient, we call it a counter current mechanism. And then so it's actively pumped on the ascending limb. It is it has to be actively pumped out because osmolarity in the future in the nephron is already lower. Fluid is hypotonic. I mean fluid is already very uh, dilute, uh, but we still want to pump more sodium out so that we still want to pump more sodium chloride out so that we concentrate this part of the material so that um, uh, because we have a lot of blood vessels here we want to reabsorb uh, urine is original hypotonic I mean urine can be hypotonic but in here we also have some reabsorption of water in this part here When urine needs to be hypertonic, when we want to concentrate the urine or when we want to reabsorb more water, we have something called antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone, also known as uh, vasopressin. So, um, So pressing, oh sorry, uh, one, one, one N, one S, one S, maybe so pressing. So ADH, antidiuretic hormone, A, also known as vasopressin, is this produced by posterior pituitary gland. Posterior pituitary gland, uh, also known as the, uh, it is the extension of the hypothalamus. It is actually part of the brain. So when we do not have ADH, um, collecting duct is impermeable to water. Impermeable, meaning that, uh, meaning that water cannot go out from the collecting duct back, back to the uh, uh, medulla here. But when we, in this case, then most of the water here can retain here and, and we have a hypotonic urine or diluted urine. But when you have ADH, then the collecting duct become permeable. What happens is that water can go out from collecting duct back into the medulla. And then in this case, you will have a concentrated urine. So diuretic, they are basically increase the flow of urine, meaning that they uh, will di diuretic. They are the uh, uh, substances that can make your urine diluted, hypotonic. Alcohol is uh, one of the major diuretic because alcohol inhibit ADH secretion from the uh, posterior pituitary gland. Uh, dehydration is the major reason that causes hangover. So when you when you are drunk, when you drink a lot, uh, you you usually need to pee a lot. That's the main reason. Caffeine is also another diuretic uh, because caffeine increases glomerular filtration rate, and but it decreases the tubular reabsorption of sodium. As I mentioned repeatedly, sodium. Uh, determine the direction of the reception of reabsorption of the water. If it decreases tubular reabsorption of sodium, that means sodium cannot go from nephron into blood vessels. Therefore, water also cannot go from uh, nephron into blood vessels. Then we have diuretic drug. Diuretic drug, um, they are specifically uh, tailor made to uh, inhibit the active transfer of sodium in the loop of honey or distal convoluted tubule. Exit base balance. Um, so we want to maintain our blood or body fluid at around 7.4 pH. If it is greater than 7.4, we call it alkal alkalosis. Less than 7.4, acidosis. We have several uh, mechanisms to maintain uh, blood or body fluid in 
in the pH of 7.4. We have the buffer system, mainly uh, the bicarbonate ion, respiratory center, our lung, yes. Through breathing, we can control the pH of the blood and the kidneys. We'll talk about all these three right now. So the pH of the blood stays near 7.4 because the blood is a buffer. Buffer, basically uh, we, we define buffer as the solution that resists the changes of the pH. The solution that can resist or that can um, stop or uh, uh, hinder or, or slow down the changes of the pH, then we call it buffer. Buffer can take up excess hydrogen ion or hydroxide ion. It can prevent the changes in the pH. How does it work? Using bicarbonate ion. If, if the blood is too acidic, that means we have excess of the hydrogen ion, bicarbonate ion can absorb this hydrogen ion to form something called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid, where can you find carbonic acid? You can find carbonic acid in soda. Most of the soda, they have uh, carbonic acid. And then, if, we, if our blood is, uh, is too basic, that means we have excess of the hydroxide ion, then um, carbon dioxide can neutralize this uh, hydroxide ion to regenerate the bicarbonate ion and water. If we increase the breathing rate to remove carbon dioxide, in, in that, we can also remove the hydrogen ion. So what happens is that if our blood is becoming too acidic, then we have a lot of carbonic acid in our blood. Carbonic acid can also dissociate into carbon dioxide and water. In this case, if we keep breathing out carbon dioxide, then um, we can force the reaction to go to the right. That means we can make more water. Uh, uh, Decrease the level of hydrogen ion and make more water, and then we breathe out carbon dioxide. Um, that's the whole reason that um, our soda has a lot of carbonic acid because soda is basically the soda company. They pump carbon dioxide into water. When when we pump carbon dioxide into water, then we form carbonic acid, and that's basically our soda. So. Uh, our lung respiratory system can adjust the proportion of bicarbonate and carbonic acid by breathing out by, by adjusting the rate of eliminating uh, carbon dioxide. Kidneys. Of course, kidney can remove uh, many acids and bases, um, but kidney is slower than the other two mechanisms. What are the other two mechanisms? that we just talked about. The other two mechanism, namely the buffer system by, of the bicarbonate ion and the respiratory system by breathing out carbon dioxide. These two, they are faster than kidney. But kidney is more powerful. Why is that? Kidney can reabsorb bicarbonate ion to help the buffer system. Or kidney can excrete hydrogen ion to help with the, uh, regulating the pH in the blood. In urine, uh, ammonia can also absorb hydrogen ion. So that, um, 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 in this case, it can help to get rid of more hydrogen ion, in this case. Phosphate can also buffer hydrogen ion in urine. So uh, both ammonium and phosphate in the urine can help to absorb more hydrogen ion. So this is the brief summary. So in here, the kidney tube, that means this part is the urine, the urine. Uh, we can reabsorb more bicarbonate ion into the blood to help to keep the blood, the blood a pH uh, in 7.4. If we have excess hydrogen ion in the blood, that means our blood is too acidic then our kidney can get rid of it by uh, combining it with ammonia. When the hydrogen ion combines with ammonia, it forms ammonium ion. Ammonium ion. Similarly, it can be combined with phosphate here.
So uh, we'll talk about disorder of kidney in the third uh, video, which should be the last one.